Everybody hear me okay? Good. So here's typically what I do. Everything that I have said, or I'm going to say, I've heard myself say before. And I don't need to hear me say it again, so this is your time. And instead of saving your questions to the end, which I find you forget them or they may lose context, listen, please, raise your hand, stop me. I taught law school for 12 years. You're not going to get me off topic. You're not going to get me down any rabbit holes that I can't come back from. So feel free to ask your questions when they come up. Um, but the thing is, is you also have a backup, and that's the slides. The slides are going to be available to anybody who uh, has left their email address, and they have a lot of good information. So they're going to supplement what we talked about, what you learned about, and they also have some resource information so that you can contact us if you have any other questions. And I would like to be a resource to you. And so I'll offer, if, if it's short questions about any part of the law, I'd be happy to text me, uh, email me, say, what about this? I'll give you my two cents worth. If it gets too much more than that, I'll tell you I'm going to have to click on the clock. But other than that, feel free to use me as a resource just to ask questions. And I do that with a lot of my business partners, a lot of my business liaison. you got a lawyer in your back pocket, so to speak. So, a little bit about me, um, other than, yes, you heard that I started with the IRS, which I actually love. It was a great opportunity. Um, it's something to have the full faith and power of the federal government behind you, <laughs> all of their resources, and be able to go and do your job knowing that uh, you've got FBI agents that have your back <laughs> and stuff like that. But here's the thing, is more than just being an attorney. I'm also, as Mr. Early said, the parent of a seriously uh, mentally ill child. And my son, Ross, uh, passed away 13 years ago. And he was 20 years old. And so, as a parent, if you have lost a child because of serious mental illness, and you couple that with self-medication. I've been where you're at. I've been where your clients are at. Ross lived with me the last three years of his life. And one of the things that we don't learn in law school, one of the things that we don't learn on the bar exam is what do you do with people who have no illness? And it's not a topic that we talk about a lot. And it kind of surprised me a little bit, but not too much, when um, Mr. Ashby said, you know, we were looking for somebody who knows a little bit about serious mental illness, and we kind of were looking, and in our organization, the Academy of Florida Elder Law Attorneys, has about 350 attorneys. Nobody knew anything about it except you. You're the only one who volunteered. And that says a couple things. One thing is, I'm glad you found me. Uh, but the second thing is, is we're not getting out education enough. And so with that said, today what I'm hoping to cover are things that can, will probably possibly help you in your own personal plan. But it's specifically geared also to help those with, uh, who have clients, that have children, that have parents that might have serious mental illness because we don't talk about it and there are some planning things that you can do that you should consider that will make your lives easier. Uh, I just, it breaks my heart. I was involved in an organization, maybe some of you have heard of it, it's called Leadership Jacksonville. Has anybody heard of leadership? They have them in different, different st states and cities. And what they teach is how to be a community trustee. And one of the topics that we had in our 12 uh, sessions was mental illness. And it was very good, but it was very unsatisfying because I learned more today in this conference than I have about mental illness anywhere else. And what a great resource this is. What a great resource. So just out of curiosity, 
How many of you deal with seriously mental ill people? Pretty much all of you. I would love your feedback on whether what I'm about ready to share is going to be helpful. But when my son turned 18, the first thing I had him do were advanced correctives. Advanced correctives include, uh, at that time, five documents. Now they include six. And I have a memorandum out on that front table if, if you want to grab one, and it describes the advanced correctives, but the durable power of attorney, the designation of healthcare surrogate, the living will, the mental health directive, and the pre need guardian directive. And, and why that is so important is this is when somebody turns 18, what happens? Thank you. You're an adult. And when you're an adult, what does that presume? You have capacity. I had a, when I was running the clinic at the law school, I had this young woman come in and she had an 18 year old son who had an abscess in his tooth and she said the dentist won't take out the abscess or treat it because my son's 18 but he's been developmentally disabled since birth and the dentist says he can't give me informed consent. So what do I do? Now, this is a case where uh, and very few attorneys do this, and this is really important for those who work with developmentally disabled people, whether they're developmentally disabled because of serious mental illness or it's because of some organic uh, type medical condition. But if you have been disabled before the age of 18, instead of doing a full-blown guardianship, which we're going to talk about in a minute, there's a thing called a guardian advocate. And a guardian advocate is so much better than a guardianship. It's under a whole different chapter. Guardianship is under 744 of the Florida statutes, but guardian advocacy is under 393. And under a guardian advocacy, you don't need to have an adjudication of incapacity. You don't have to go to the court and be declared in capacity. If you've been development, developmentally disabled, the court relaxes a lot of those restrictions and can appoint a decision maker to help you make those decisions in life. Well, she came in and she said, I'm in trouble. And I say, why is that? She says, 20 years ago, two years before I had my baby, I was convicted of a felony. Now let me share with you what that meant. He couldn't give consent because he's been developmentally disabled and he didn't have enough function to give informed consent. So he couldn't make his own decisions. Now this mother who did a spectacular job raising this young man for 18 years could not be his decision maker anymore because of this prior felony. And there was no forgiveness. A government, governor's pardon, an expungement, wouldn't have changed that. If you're a felon in Florida, you're not going to be a guardian. So knowing this kind of background, that you want to keep the courts out of your life as much as possible, your best protection against a guardianship is that durable power of truth. Now, what's one of the biggest misconceptions we have when we do a state plan? Let me ask you, how many in this room have their durable powers of attorney? Show of hands. I see one, two, three. Okay. And I don't know how many people are in this room, but it's more than three. And so here's the question. Why not? So I'm going to pick on somebody. Um, somebody who didn't raise their hand. This young woman over here with the glasses. How come you don't have one? Why don't you have a durable power of attorney? Thank you. Okay. That's an honest answer. That's an honest answer. Okay. You know, when I had a hundred law students up there, I'd ask them, how many of you have your durable power powers of attorney? And out of a hundred, four people would raise their hand. 
And I said, well, what about the rest of you? And nobody raised their hand. I said, do you need them? That's all I'll ask you guys. Do you need them? Not only do your clients need them, or your seriously mentally uh, ill illness, children and family members need, do you need them? Okay, the reason why is it has nothing to do with how much money you have or how many assets you have or don't have. It has everything to do with keeping the courts out of your life. If you are incapacitated because you're either developmentally disabled or you have a serious mental illness or you are have dementia or you have incapacity, and you cannot make your financial decisions, if you haven't given that authority to somebody in writing, you need a guardianship. Flat out simple, you just need a guardianship. Once the guardianship court gets a hold of you, rarely, rarely does it let go, and you'll probably be under a guardianship for the rest of your life. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about guardianships in a minute, but your durable power of attorney is your best hedge against the guardianship. Now, I've had 20 years olds that I have had in guardianships because they've gotten in accidents. And guess what? No matter how much their parents love them, and they were even still living at home, their parents couldn't do any of their financial decisions for them. Couldn't transfer their cars, couldn't transfer uh, their bank accounts, couldn't pick up their paychecks. So the durable power of attorney is your best protection against a guardianship. That's going to be what keeps the courts out of your life. So, a lot of people say, well, I have a durable power of attorney. I got it off one of these computer programs or I got it from a friend. Can you sense a problem with that, maybe? Thank you. This young woman says, I have one for my stepson because of his serious mental illness, but I don't have one for myself. If you should have a stroke or you became incapacitated for some reason, how long have you been married? Five and a half years. Does your husband love you? Okay. Can your husband transact your financial affairs without that written authority? Yeah. And that's the problem. I could not transact Ross's financial affairs without that written power of attorney. Ross was one of the most awesome people I've ever been associated with. And I know he's my son, but he was a kind, sensitive, respectful, sincere, helpful individual. He was always, always a good example. Until he started developing symptoms of schizoaffective disorder, coupled with self-medication. And it changed him. And we've heard better than I can, I'm not as eloquent as, as Mr. Early uh, on this, but we have heard the changes that, that happen when somebody has got serious mental illness. And I saw Ross be go from that most wonderful, I mean, I never had problems with him as a kid, ever. He never gave me a moment of grief. I never had to spank him. I never had to, I might have raised my voice, I don't remember. But when he got the illness and he started self-medicating, he changed. And not in a good way. It took him of his dignity, it took him of his self-esteem, it took him of his ambition and his enthusiasm and his hope. And that's what killed him. He lost his hope. One of the reasons I love this conference today is I have hope. I listen to, to Kevin Hyatt speak and I listen to, to Mr. Early and his success with his song. And it gives me hope. When we lose hope, what was it? You can go without water for eight days and through 40 days, hope, and that's what 
uh, I've learned to realize so, that documents for our seriously mentally ill clients, loved ones, children, parents, for ourselves, those will protect you from having court involvement. So the power of attorney is the most important. Let me give you one example of what happened to a woman that I know that didn't have one. Her husband went to work, he was 48, went to work, got carbon monoxide poisoning, and within a few minutes he was signed by a vegetarian vegetarian person. And she said, Mike, I want to make a claim on workers' comp, but they won't honor my power of attorney. I said, well, let me look at it. And it was one from Office Depot. This was before LegalZoom and all of them get online. And it came in a computer program, and it said durable all over it. And I said, well, unfortunately, it's not a Florida durable power of attorney. She said, well, it's good in all 50 states. And I said, yeah, but Florida requires certain language, and it doesn't have it. And so your durable power of attorney is only a general power of attorney. Here's the difference. In the general power of attorney, when somebody becomes incapacitated, your agency stops. So when he became incapacitated, she had no authority. A durable power of attorney is the only kind of a power of attorney that will survive an incapacity. And so I said, well, it says durable all over it, but it doesn't have the necessary language. But my, the banks have been letting me use it. Are any of you bankers? Good, because I, I love bankers, but I don't. I've never had a banker give good legal advice ever. 100% of the time they're wrong. And it's always been bad advice and it's always called fault. But the bank has always let me use this power of attorney. I said, well, that's because you're joint owner on all of the accounts. But you're asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars from an insurance company. They know what a power of attorney is. They know you don't have one. And now you need a guardianship. So this is a time you don't want to be pennies wise and pounds foolish. We ended up doing a guardianship for her, and every step of the way, we had to get court permission. We had to open up the guardianship. We had to have an examining committee appointed. We had to have him evaluated and declared incapacitated, and then the court had to appoint a guardian. That was half of it. The other half is everything we wanted to do, we had to get court permission. So we had to get court permission to file a workers' comp claim. We had to get court permission to accept the claim when we reached settlement. But worse, we had to get court permission every time we wanted to spend a dollar. All of that could have been avoided with a good power of attorney. So, first of all, we've learned we need one. All of us do. Second, it has to be sufficient. Because if it isn't sufficient, you're going to be in the guardianship, and the court's going to be making the decisions. Okay. Any questions on the powers of attorney so far? Yes. If the question is, is, should I have it reviewed? And the answer is yes, you should have it reviewed. If you want to email it to me, I'll send you an email back saying, I've looked at it, and here's where it's good, or here's where it's bad. And the reason why is because even some of my colleagues, now, I don't know that you guys know this, but not every attorney is created equal. And some of my colleagues are really, really good at criminal defense. They're really good at family law, which I know nothing about. But they're really lousy at knowing why we have directives. And they'll give you directives. And they'll actually charge you three times what I will for them, but they don't know what they do. So a lot of times, they don't have the proper language, even though it was prepared by an attorney. So I'd be happy to look at it. I'd be happy to offer that to this whole class. My cards are out there. If you all send me an email, say, here's the power of attorney I have, would you just look at it and give you my two cents worth? In 2011, the power of attorney law changed significantly in Florida. 
Ours went from four pages to 16 pages. And the reason why is because the legislature said, if the authority is not included in writing in this power of attorney, you don't have it. And if you need it and you don't have it, now you're in front of the guardianship court. So ours throws in everything, including the kitchen sink. You want them powerful, you want them broad. And there's five areas in that power of attorney that have to be separately initialed in order to have that authority. And so when you look at the Florida power of attorney you have, were there parts on there that you had to initial? Now, isn't that funny? It had a page for her to accept it, but that's not a legal requirement. So we don't even do that page. We don't, sometimes parents don't want their kids to know that they gave them power of attorney. So we don't have an initial it at all. We don't even have that page. But the initials, the, the important ones are to create trust powers and to be able to change beneficiary designations. Okay. But I'd be happy to look at it. Because you don't want to find out it's not sufficient when you're incapacitated. Because then it's too late to change. The next document is really important, and that's your designation of health care survey. Why is that important? If you don't have certain authority in writing, not only for finances, but for health care, again, you could have decisions being made by somebody you don't want to have made. One of the documents we're going to talk about is that mental health directive. And one of the things that you want to be sure that you give your health care surrogate is authority to make your mental health decisions. Have you guys run into clients or situations where they've had a mental health directive? Has anybody in this room ever seen one? Okay, so you've seen one. And what does the mental health directive you've seen allow? Do you remember? Okay. Most of my colleagues don't even know what one is, so they don't even provide. Um, but our mental health directive has three parts to it primarily, but there's space to write in other things. But it has the decision on psychoactive medications, convulsive therapy that we heard Kevin talk about, and restraints. And so the reason that we have these written directives is if it's in writing, the court can enforce it. The court can understand what your intention is and enforce it. If it doesn't have it in writing, you may not have your intentions on it. Yes, sir. Is it assumed that the durable medical power of attorney would be the same person who would make decisions related to mental health issues? Excellent question. The question is, is it assumed that the designation of health care surrogate is going to be the same person making your mental health decisions? Unless you specify otherwise, yes, that will be true. That will be true. So if you want different people, you need to specify the different capacities. So that's a good question. Um, yes? What happens if the hospital won't recognize Oh, excellent question. What happens if the hospitals won't recognize it? Um, and I had that case happen. I had uh, a nephew who was the... Uh, guardian of his aunt, and she had a living will, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Well, I'll tell you what a living will is. The living will is not your last will and testament. The living will says if I'm in a persistent vegetative state or an end stage condition or an irreversible condition, my surrogate has the right to refuse or remove artificial life support. And she had one of these. She had one of these living wills, and he said, my, she's on her deathbed, but the doctor won't honor her living will. And I said, well, there's a couple things. And we went through a series of questions. And I said, why does he want to not honor? He says, 
I want to keep her alive for 60 days, and then after 60 days, we'll make a determination, and then we can honor it again. And I said, what's the magic of the 60 days? Because it didn't make sense to us. And after about 45 minutes, I said, Bill, how many Medicare days does your aunt have left? Well, about 60 days. He wanted to keep her alive to build the Medicare. So, we have had situations where, for bad motives, hospitals and doctors don't want to honor it. So what the statute says is you can change her doctor, you can change her hospital to one that will honor it. Now, in her case, she died the next day, so it didn't really matter. But, because otherwise we would have had to go to court and fight it. But the easiest thing to do is just change hospitals, change doctors. But it's Can you have the doctor changed in the Baker Act facility, in the mental health facility? You may not have any of the doctors. So if you can't find a different doctor, then you might have to take that one to court and get the court to enforce it. Um, but you're talking about a Baker Act that is lasting over 72 hours then. Yeah, so somebody, what happens at 72 hours with the Baker Act? Does everybody know what a Baker Act is here? Because that was one of the questions that I had. Okay, so in the Baker Act, they can put you in a mental health facility for 72 hours for evaluation. What happens after that 72 hours? In the law, we call that due process. And under due process, what do we have under due process? The right to a hearing, the right to notice, and the right to representation. Then, after the 72 hours, they should start a commitment type proceeding. Now, the psychiatrist is probably the one who's doing it, but the fact is, is the patient, our loved ones, still have the right to due process. They still have a right to challenge that uh, commitment hearing. But if, if they don't challenge it, or if they do stay in there over 72 hours, then you might have to go to court to change out the care provider if that becomes an issue. Well, that's where the, the court appointed attorney comes in and talks to them for five minutes and represents them at the Baker Act, Baker Act and it's the same attorney that's probably seen 15 other patients that day, and he doesn't even know their names, or she doesn't even know their names. Yeah. But nonetheless, that is due process, right? They've been given an attorney, and it, it's not perfect. And that's why if you can prevent having the courts involved, you should. There is one other thing I want to share with you about the Living Global, because it's kind of interesting, the history of it. And uh, does anybody remember the Karen Ann Quinlan case? Yeah. yeah. So that was 1976. So when I had the 100 law students up there, and I said, how many of you need your directives, and nobody raised their hand, I said, let me kind of give you a litany, because all of you are under 25 years old. I said, let's talk about the law of the living will. Because if it's not in writing, it may not be honored. So, that's what happened to Terry Scheibel, right? How old was Terry Scheibel? About 24. She didn't have a living will. Does everybody remember the Terry Scheibel case? This is a young woman who was in a persistent vegetative state. And after eight years of being on a feed, feeding tube, her husband moved to have the feeding tube removed. And the press crucified him. He's out for her money. He's out to, uh, to kill his wife. He wants to get married again. Now, let me give you some background. He watched his wife for eight years not make any improvement at all. Just withering away in that bed without any quality of and after eight years, he says, enough is enough. I don't think I would have waited eight years. I wouldn't have wanted to see my spouse live for 
even a year under that kind of condition. But she did not have a written living will. So the parents came in and said, well, that's not Terry, what Terry would have wanted, which started another eight years of litigation. Was the husband going to get that million dollar policy? No, it was all going to go to medical expenses. He wasn't going to get a penny of it. So for 16 years, we fought that battle with Terry Schiavo, where if she had had a written living will, there would have been no question. It would have been over and done with within months. So that's the Terry Schiavo case. 1976, it really started with Karen Ann Clinton. Karen Ann Clinton was a young woman, about 23, found in a persistent vegetative state. And that was the first case where the court, the Supreme Court of the United States said, listen, we have a zone of privacy. We have medical autonomy. We have the right to refuse medical treatment. Before then, it was considered homicide or euthanasia or suicide. But the court said, we have a right to elect whether or not we want these medical procedures. And they allowed uh, a woman to make that decision, uh, Karen Ann Quillen. After that, California was the first sta state to enact the living will statute, but that was the first time it was legal. Well, that rocked along for about 16 years, and then in 1990, Nancy Cruzan. Remember her? Another young woman in her early 20s. That one went to the Supreme Court and says, if your directives aren't in writing, you haven't met the burden of proof, and they don't have to be honored. So everybody went out there and got it in writing. So if you notice, Karen Ann Quillen, Nancy Cruzan, Terry Scheibel, what did they all have in common? The laws that we live under today the significant laws of the living will were all created by young women under 25. So then I looked up at the law students. I said, now how many of you those directives? And it started sinking in. If we don't have our wishes in writing, they may not be able. If our serious mentally ill loved ones don't have their wishes in writing, then the court gets to decide. And like that attorney at Lydon, who may spend five minutes with them, those decisions are going to impact their life and quality of life for the rest of their life. So we need a durable power of attorney, health care service, living well, and a mental health director. The mental health director, I'll tell you, when I do that, some of the reactions I get are kind of, uh, funny. Um, when we get to the convulsive therapy, the electroshock therapy, the most common answer I get is, do they still do that? Now, it was real interesting that Kevin mentioned that today because he had 26 episodes, but it helped him. I've had several clients that have had ECT, and it has helped him. Matter of fact, I was in uh, Wakaiva. Wakaiva is one of our sponsors. I was in Wakaiva and I was called there and I met with a gentleman and he couldn't even say two or three coherent words. He was in a catatonic depression. And his power of attorney agent and, and healthcare surgeon was his, uh, his aunt. And his aunt said they want to give him shock treatment. We have the authority to do it. And so we went through the legal proceedings to get that done. And, um, about four weeks later, five weeks later, maybe two months later, this gentleman walks in the door. And he kind of looked a little familiar, but not really. He says, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, no, not really. He says, I was at Wakai, and you came to visit me. And I had those shock treatments, and now I'm better. And he was. He says, I need to finish my estate planning. And he was a good client for years after that. So it can work. It can. Yes? I've seen the guardian advocate for many people. Usually, the ones that are here, I've had several that have been hospitalized for maybe six months to a year with major depression. Most dramatic one was a woman that had been flat on her back, feeding to, um, I mean, they basically, a 
That's the thing. It can be life-saving. I've had a dozen doctors and nurses who actually have either administered ECT or, uh, or knew about it. They all signed the directive. Uh, I've had clients that have had ECT before. They signed the directive. I'm not saying this for everyone, but the directives are to let people know what is your decision. It's all really about you. This is, these are what these directives are for, is they let people know what is important to you. What do you want to have? I call it my tiebreaker, and I use it a lot in second families because what happens is dad's married, new mom, uh, dad goes in, has major depression, mom wants to, uh, new stepmom wants to do convulsive therapy, and the kids don't want it. So the mental health directive is that tiebreaker because if dad, while he had capacity, came in and said, I want it, and he gave his new wife the authority to uh, consent to it, then the kids really don't have a leg to stand on. Otherwise, we can get tied up in courts for a long time and spend a lot of money on that. So that's why I call it my tiebreaker. Now, the next document, and how about, how we go on time? because I want to make sure that we cover everything that you guys want to cover. Um, the pre-need guardian just says, if I need a guardianship, here's who I want my guardians to be. Now, this, briefly, does anybody have any experience with guardianships? You have, yeah? Because you're a guardian advocate. Well, I'm also a guardian. Um, tell me, just in, in two or three small sentences, what is your opinion of guardianships? Well, in my case, it was necessary to happen because he has laughed and decided to help me totally. But it costs a fortune. Um, it's very expensive, or at least it was for me. No, it's expensive for everyone because every time you need to get court permission, who do you have to take with you? Me. Yeah, you have to take an attorney, and, and we are, can be expensive. So not only is it expensive, it's very intrusive, because the court makes your decisions. The court makes your decisions. So if we can avoid the guardianship, we should. It's our last resort. But you said something very important. Sometimes it's necessary. When we have our loved ones that are not taking their medications, and they need to. Can you force them as a healthcare surrogate to take their medications? Can you do it as the power of attorney? How is the only way you can force that person to take their medications? But getting them to the state hospital without being their guardian, sometimes you can't get them there. So here's the thing is, even though you have the durable power of attorney and the healthcare surrogate, the living well, sometimes you still need that guardianship, especially for our seriously mentally ill loved ones. And the reason why we do is because we cannot force them to go into a facility. We cannot force them to take their medicines. Unless the court has adjudicated them as incapacitated and taken those rights away, and appointed a guardian to make those decisions for them. Without that, we're powerless. And the hardest cases that we have, our hardest guardianship cases, are those who are not taking their medications. Because what happens, and we see it over and over again, we get the examining committee appointed, and between the time that the guardianship is open and we have the guardianship hearing, guess what they start doing? They're taking their medicines. So they come to the hearing, and guess what? I'm fine, Judge. Sorry I scared you. And then as soon as that hearing's over, what do they do? They stop taking their medicines. So it's real difficult to get somebody in on guardianship that way. But if the examining committee is aware of the situation, a lot of times they'll take that in consideration. And at that point, appoint a limited guardianship so that the guardian at least has the authority to make their medical decisions for them. And sometimes we need a guardianship for that. 
and the durable power of attorney and the health care surrogate isn't going to be sufficient. We also see guardianships necessary when our elderly are being exploited, when they are vulnerable and they cannot stop the loved one from taking their checkbook or taking money out of their account. When they can't help themselves, sometimes we need a guardianship to protect them. I want to kind of go into um, what other questions do you have that you want to cover in the time that we have? I just saw her hand first, but we'll come back to you. No, I was just wondering, when there is no family, um, what, uh, what does a principal uh, look for in terms of uh, someone to advocate for them um, in the event of all of these circumstances when family is not? Available. When they have estranged their family because of their prior conduct and there is nobody left, and, and you can't, if the person has resources, you're okay because you can hire a professional guardian, and uh, that person is actually paid to be their guardian. The problems that we run into is the person who has alienated all their loved ones and they have no assets. There is a public guardianship that you can. Uh, ask for, but sometimes the waiting list is two to five years that's so backed up. But usually it's a loved one or a professional guardian that will step into that position. And anybody can file the petition. I'm not giving you advice, but you guys can start a guardianship on me while I'm here talking. You can say, I don't like the speaker, I'm going to go down to the court, I'm going to start a guardianship. And you can do that. So anybody can start one, but I don't suggest it. First of all, I hope I haven't made anybody seriously mad enough to want to do that because that's a terrible thing. But you got to find somebody who'll step to the plate or pay somebody or get on that public guardianship waiting list. What questions do they ask when they're looking for a professional guardian? Well, how do you know what questions to ask? So you're the caregiver or you're the social. No, you're the only one left. You've outlived everybody else. You're and, Oh, for you. Right. Now, what do you do? Oh, so the, excellent what question. What kinds of questions do you ask? Excellent questions for yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you have assets, you come to my office, I can find you a professional guardian. But let's talk about that, because this is really important. And this happens a lot, uh, actually. People have nobody left. Um, I had a, a gentleman who was one of my law students, and uh, his parents had dementia, and so he took care of them, and he came back to me about 10 years later and says, I'm going to take the bar, can I come work for you? He had, his parents had died, he had no spouse, he had no children, he had no siblings, he had nobody. And we find that more and more. And it really hit home, because he's a little bit younger than me, and he was the victim of a hit and run last year, last October. And there was nobody to call. We were it. I was his boss and really his only friend left. So when you run into that situation, then if you have assets, you hire a professional guardian. If you don't have assets, then do you have any close friends? Do you have any siblings? Do you have any nephews or nieces? Do you have any clergy that would be willing to step into that position? Do you know any social workers that would be willing to step into that? Now, if you recognize you need the assistance, you probably don't need a guardianship, but you could appoint somebody as your power of attorney, as your health care surrogate, and those are always revocable, so if you get in a tiff with them, you can always revoke it. But there's also a thing called a voluntary guardianship, and in a voluntary guardianship, you go to the court, because your doctor has says you understand what you are relinquishing, and the court will appoint you a decision maker, usually somebody that you've selected, again, that friend or that nephew or niece or 
that clergy person or the social worker or your, your neighbor. The court will appoint that person, but they will not adjudicate you as incapacitated. Since it's a voluntary guardianship, you can terminate it at any time. But while you're under that guardianship, you're not subject to the same amount of exploitation. You can't enter into contracts by yourself. So you're not going to have somebody come and have you sign your house away because that's a null and void act under a voluntary guardianship. So you have different levels. The power of attorney to start with. The voluntary guardianship is the next least restrictive level. And then an involuntary guardianship at the very last resort. Any other questions on that point? Okay. How about you? What was yours? Okay. Well, most people just say power of attorney, but there is a difference, and that is there's there's several types of powers of attorney. There's limited, which is limited to a specific action. A lot of people go to banks and they get this limited power of attorney and they think, well, I got my power of attorney, so I'm okay. Well, they aren't. They're good for that one bank. But that's it. They, nothing else. Um, but primarily there's a general power of attorney and a durable power. If you have a general power of attorney and you become incapacitated, your uh, power of attorney's agency stops and they can't help you anymore. The durable power of attorney is the only kind of a power of attorney that will survive your incapacity so your agent can continue to help you. Like in the case I shared with, the husband became incapacitated. So that general power of attorney gave his wife no more rights but a durable power of attorney would allow her to act outside of the guardianship. And that's why it's so important to have a durable power of attorney. Does the durable power of attorney survive death? No. No power of attorney survives death. So, let's talk a little bit about how to plan, and I do want to spend just a few minutes on this. We have loved ones. That some of them have serious mental illness. And we want to protect them where we can, but we can't give them a dollar. I couldn't give my son a dollar. Couldn't do anything directly. But I created a trust for him, a revocable trust. And in that revocable trust, I had some protections. And under that trust, I was able to provide for him housing. So he had dignity, so he always had a place to live. I was able to provide food for him. I was able to provide medical care for him, but he never had a dollar, he never had an asset in his name, so he couldn't sell it or trade it or abuse it, but he always had uh, a roof over his head and medical and, and food. So one of the mistakes we see a lot, and it's, it's common, is you have two kids. You have one that's got the serious mental illness, you have the other ones that's fine. Son, I'm going to leave you all of my property. You take care of your brother. Good idea or bad idea? Bad idea. Because what happens is you give all of the assets to the one son, and he goes into bankruptcy, or he gets a divorce, or he gets sued by uh, a creditor, he's got IRS problems. Now you have both sons disinherited. The way we protect our beneficiaries is through trust. A revocable living trust is absolutely essential. If you're already receiving government benefits like SSDI or SSI, a special needs trust can protect what you are giving away to supplement their quality of life, to supplement their quality of care without interfering with their government benefits. The trust is really the only way we can do that. Well, I would. Again, when you're talking about something as significant as leaving an estate to somebody, it's not a time to be pennies wise and pounds foolish. I mean, would you want to go and take out your own appendix or do your own talk selecting? People underappreciate the legal experience that helps protect them. And it's really easy to, you know, I, I see Tiger Woods play golf. And I think, I can play golf, but I can't. I hear somebody sing, and I say, oh, 
I can sing, but I can't. We make it look easy, but I can promise you that some of these critical matters, the mistakes, the ramifications can be so serious and so devastating, why leave it to chance? You know, hire the people that can help you get there. So, yes, ma'am. Correct. You cannot be deemed incapacitated by a court and sign a power of attorney for yourself. Question. Who deemed him as incapacitated? That's the question. Who does that? Okay. See, that's the big, beautiful thing about it. And I can't tell you how many times I've been into hospices, hospitals, assisted living facilities, and been told by the medical staff, that person can't sign these directives. They got dementia. They're incompetent. And I go in there and I talk to them. And they know who their loved one is. They know what it means to be giving up access to their property and to turn over control to somebody else. That's sufficient capacity to sign a durable power of attorney, to enter into contracts, and to make a will. It's not a medical decision. It's a legal decision. And if they understand the consequences of their actions, they have capacity. And I don't care if they've been diagnosed with dementia. I don't care if they have been uh, told by two doctors, you're incapacitated and you don't have your driver's license anymore, that's okay. It doesn't mean that they are necessarily incapacitated to do their directives. Knowing that the alternative is a guardianship, we look hard for capacity. We look hard, especially in a situation where the daughter for the last seven or eight years has been helping mom with her finances and the law changes. Mom doesn't really understand fully all the changes in the law, but she's trusted her daughter for seven years before her daughter's her current power of attorney, but she needs to update her documents. I'm going to find capacity because she trusted that person. Yes. Mm, great question. When does the durable power of attorney kick in? Before 2011, we used to have what's called springing powers of attorney, and it would not kick in until you were actually deemed incapacitated. And the legislature said, no, we're going to get rid of that. Powers of attorney are immediately effective. So as soon as you sign them and you walk out of my office, your agent has that authority. So there's a couple things you think about. And here's how I always explain it to my clients, is first of all, you should be choosing, the, the question you should be ch asking yourself is, not who is the lawyer in the family, who's the financial planner, who is the nurse? The question you should be asking is, who do you trust to make your decisions? Who do you trust is the decision? It doesn't matter where they live or how old they are. Who do you trust to make your decision? So, you want to put in somebody that you trust. You can always revoke it. You want to make sure. I had a couple. I, I love this story. Uh, they were married 60 years. And a lot of my best stories come from people married 60 years or more now. Hank and Susan are coming up on their 50th, so you got to go about 10 more years before the stories get good. But the... Um, at 60 years, I had a gentleman and his wife come in, and I said to the wife, who do you want as your health care surrogate? She said, well, I want my husband and then my daughter. And I asked him, I said, who do you want as your health care surrogate? Well, I want my wife and then I want my daughter. And I said, would you like to be an organ donor? He says, yes, I would. And his wife goes, what? Nobody wants those old organs. And she says, well, I'm going to donate them. And she says, no, you're not. Well, yes, I'm going to donate them. No, you're not going to donate your organs. Mr. Jorgensen, can I change my health care surrogate from my wife to my daughter? Which we did. And I never saw him after that, so I don't know if they were married 61 years. <laughs> but it was real interesting to me. They slept in the same bed for 60 years, and she didn't know what he wanted. And when he did tell her what she wanted, it probably wasn't the first time he learned. She wasn't going to do what he wanted anyway. 
That's not the person you want as your surrogate. So when you're asking your question, who should I make as my surrogate, it shouldn't be who's my oldest kid or who am I married to. Who do you trust? Now, in my case, it works. My wife, she wants to be buried, and she wants to be kept alive for at least three months. I don't want that for myself. I said, if I become a couch potato and life support, even if it's on a cruise ship and you have to throw me overboard, I don't want artificial life support. Because she will honor my choices for me, even though that's not what she wants for herself, She's my proper surrogate. And because I will honor her choices, I'm not going to do what I want for her. I'm going to do what she wants. I'm her surrogate. And that's the way your power of attorney should be. That's the way your health care should be. Question. So I was the caregiver for both my grandparents, and I had the same situation. Um, and so I Well, that's a great point, because your power of attorney, you are an agent for them. So if I were a facility, I would first take my direction from them. I would only rely on your agency if I did not have their direction. And because you have that power of attorney, we see this all the time. Mom and daughter come in, daughter gets power of attorney, all of a sudden she's telling mom what to do. I tell the mom, you can revoke that at any time. The power of attorney doesn't make you the boss. You are still an agent. It doesn't replace her agency, it supplements it. Yes, sir. There was something you said a little bit ago. I always understood uh, incompetence towards a legal decision and incapacity over the medical decision. So oh. Exactly that's not right. Okay. So what's the difference between the two and the two processes? Is there Thank you. The question is, what's the difference between incompetence and incapacity? There isn't. What happened is, we used to call it incompetent. And then the law changed about 20 years ago, now we call it incapacity. Same word, same definition, and it's still a legal determination. Now, do we rely on the medical field to support our legal decision that this person has incapacity? Of course, if we do a guardianship and we appoint an examining committee, there's going to be three, usually a doctor and two psychologists, or a doctor and two social workers that have a lot of experience. And they're going to meet with this person for that five or 30 minutes, and they're going to issue reports. And the court is going to make decisions that's going to impact this person's life for the rest of their life based on those reports. And we rely on those doctors to help us make our decisions on capacity but it's still a legal determination and it's the judge who has to declare it. And if you haven't been declared incapacitated by a judge or haven't had your rights taken away in a commitment hearing like a Baker Act or a Marchman Act, then you have capacity. You're presumed to have capacity once you're over 18. Good questions. Yes. Excellent question. Same thing I did with my son, who was a drug addict and uh, showed signs of schizo-defective order as early as 16. Very first thing I did as soon as he turned 18 is he gave me a birthday present and he signed those advanced directives. That is absolutely, if they have enough capacity, and what I mean with that, if they understand who their parents are, they trust their parents, they want their parents to manage their financial and health care decisions, I'm going to have them sign those documents. And that should be sufficient to keep them out of the guardianship court unless they stop taking their medicines. And then sometimes you need the guardianship court. Hank, did I see your question? I have a question. Um, I don't know if this is kind of off a little bit. Um, talking about the power of attorney, um, Parent does 
allow kids to walk out the door that we declare needed and involuntary examination? Yeah. That's a great question. I love your questions. And I didn't plan to any of them. These are all coming from you guys. Um, when you have somebody who is under 18, unless the parent's rights have been terminated by a court of law, the parent has the absolute right to make the child's decisions until they turn 18. And you can have a Baker acted, and you can have a Marchman acted, but it's ultimately the parent who gets to make that decision. Now, once they turn 18, then the kid gets to make that decision, and if he doesn't make the right decision, then the Baker Act and the Marshman Act will. But unfortunately, the way the law is written, you as a parent have that right as their natural guardian. So I'll go back to Bob's question. Um, you Yes and no. The durable power of attorney and the healthcare surrogate, you are their agent. So you cannot force them. You can act as their agent, but they are still the decision maker. If they're under 18, that parent is the decision maker. If you don't like the parent's decision because it's in the, not in the best interest of the child, you're going to probably have to file. Um, it's going to get complicated. And I don't know an easy way around it, but you're going to have to terminate that parental's rights, get them under the protective order of the court, and then have that court-appointed attorney ad litem make that child's decision. Once they're 18, you just go strictly to the guardianship. The guardianship is the only way. If they're over 18 and they haven't given you health care surrogate or access to their medical records, the only way is through a guardianship. That's the only way. Who's declared them incompetent? The doctor, right? Not the court. If the court has deemed them to be you got to remember, there's a difference between a capacity hearing, like a guardianship, and a commitment hearing, like a Baker Act. A commitment hearing can serve like incapacity, and the same court that issues that commitment can also give you access to those records. Again, it's due process. Once you give that individual due process, the court can override it through due process. But it's got to either be through an incapacity hearing like guardianship, or it's got to be through a commitment hearing. Or if you've got a parent involved, you've got to get that kid under protective order of the court and get the parent's rights suspended. Yes? That's a really hard question. Do we let them come to school and take their kid because you Baker Act? I think the Baker Act would trump 
their right, I think you have the right to at least take them to the mental health hospital because the Baker Act says without due process, that ex parte type communication, you can put somebody under evaluation for up to 72 hours. That has been ruled not to be a violation of your constitutional rights. So I think you're doing the right thing in the fact that you have Baker Acted them, they're on their way, and the parent can go and argue with the mental health facility, but the law is pretty clear that you have the right to Baker Act somebody who is of imminent harm now. Now, whether the mental health facility lets them loose, you probably don't have a lot of discretion. Yes? The durable power of attorney has to be notarized and witnessed by two impartial witnesses. The health care surrogate just needs two impartial witnesses. They have different functions. The durable power of attorney is for finances. The health care surrogate is for their finance or their health care decisions. So you have to decide, what hat are you wearing? Yes. Could you say something a little bit about the, like the judiciary, guarding, durable power of attorney, the roles of each, and what we can do when you need a fiduciary? I've had clients who have fiduciaries appointed, but they, they appear to be able to manage their finances. It's not so easy to get that taken right away from the contract. And what can be done about that? The law creates a fiduciary responsibility in a lot of different situations. Like, for example, a durable power of attorney agent has a fiduciary responsibility towards the principal. A trustee has a fiduciary duty towards the beneficiaries. A guardian has fiduciary responsibilities for the ward. The VA veterans agent has fiduciary duties to the veteran. So the law creates fiduciary duties in a lot of different circumstances, and some of them are imposed by statute, some of them are imposed by the court. So you have to look at what is the actual situation that you want. A durable power of attorney has a fiduciary duty towards the principal, but the principal can revoke that durable power of attorney very easily. So that fiduciary responsibility can end very quickly. But where we see it is where a, uh, a child is the parent's durable power of attorney and is misspending the parent's money. That child is breaching that fiduciary responsibility and can actually go to jail for that. They can be arrested and they can go to jail and they can be incarcerated. A trustee can be removed as the trustee if they breach a fiduciary. Very difficult, but it can happen. In the court, like in a guardianship court, the court can declare a breach of the guardian's fiduciary duty and remove the guardian. So you have to let me know what is the situation and I can tell you where their duty comes from and how to get rid of it. But they're all different. Yes. Excellent. What's the difference between a special needs trust and a revocable trust? Let's kind of do a little bit broader picture. There's two primary trusts. There's a revocable trust, which is pretty much easily changeable, and an irrevocable trust. All trusts have three parties. You have the grantor, that's the person who puts the property into the trust. Then you have the trustee as a party, and then you have the beneficiaries. So that is typical in every trust, the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiaries. In a revocable trust, you're all three. You are the grantor, you are the trustee, and you are the beneficiary. So you have 100% access to your property because you have 100% access to your property, so do your creditors. In an irrevocable trust, you are usually not the trustee or the beneficiary. You can still be the grantor, you can still create that trust. But you have given up your right to be the trustee and the beneficiary in most cases, and as such, we can protect your property from your creditors, including Medicaid. So what do we do planning? 
Now, most special needs trusts are irrevocable trusts. So the beneficiary of that is usually not the grantor and is usually not the trustee. Therefore, we can protect the property. But there's two kinds of special needs trusts. Actually, there's more than two, but there's two kind of categories. There's a third party special needs trust, and then there's a first party special needs trust. So let me give you an example. I'm in a car accident, and I get an award, but I'm on government benefits. If I create a special needs trust, which is irrevocable, it's called a third party special needs trust. And if there's anything left over when I die, it has to go back to pay back Medicaid if I'm on Medicaid. And that's why you use the special needs trust is to keep somebody on their government benefits. But if it's a third party, and this is really important, I'm glad you brought this up. Because if we create a special needs trust for our uh, seriously mentally ill loved ones, that has no payback provisions. That supplements their quality of life. It supplements their government benefits. It doesn't replace them. So like I'm a parent and I create the special needs trust for Ross. It's an irrevocable special needs trust and as long as he's receiving government benefits, the money that I have in that trust for Ross is not counted against his government benefits. It doesn't have to be paid back to Medicaid when Ross dies. So that's the difference between an irrevocable special needs trust being a third party special needs trust and an irrevocable first party special needs trust with the payback provisions. And that's a lot of information to us to absorb in the quick definition I gave. But I do have some slides on that. If you ever have any questions about that, please feel free to contact me. Be happy to go over that. That is how we protect our loved ones. We don't have to disinherit them. We put their property, their inheritance, in a trust, and we can protect them from everyone including government benefits. Yes? So, say somebody wanted to come in and do the typical power of attorney, like typical charge for that. It depends. If you go to my colleagues who do criminal law, they don't know a thing about powers of attorney, they'll charge you about 1500 Our office charges 550 But when you get all of the directives, the power of attorney, I'll care, sir, that we know. You go to Miami, you can spend three or four thousand. So, you come to Jacksonville, I'll give you a better deal. Be very careful when you're looking for something you're not. I had to do it for my grandparents, and I gave $15,000 for their house. I just want my dad to have his gun, same town, he paid 750 Yeah, there's not every attorney is created equal. Did I say that? <laughs> and they were both elder law attorneys. Yeah, and that's, the, that's something really important is. Get references, talk to your friends. Just because you say you're an elder law attorney doesn't mean you are. I released about 1,500 law students out who said they're elder law attorneys, and I can venture to say that none of them really understand elder law. They sure did when I graduated. Yes? Is that per person, or do you do things? Yeah, what happens is I usually charge, personally, I charge 600 for an individual, I charge 750 for a couple. So it's for an extra 150 day, the spouse can take. If you bring in a child who's unmarried, over 18, usually less than about 30, I charge 100 bucks because I want them to be protected. Um, I can't express how important it is. So like, I have a lot of clients that are in their 50s and they have kids going off to college. I'll do their powers of attorney and, and healthcare surrogates for $100 just because they need that protection. But there's more to it than just powers of attorney. You've got to remember if you're trying to protect them, you might need a trust. You try to provide, uh, prevent probate, you might need certain kinds of deeds to prevent probate. So there's, there could be more to that planning, but if it's just the protections, like if you guys said, uh, if I needed to do phase one, what's the most important thing I can do for myself? This is the most important thing I can do for my seriously uh, mentally ill loved one. 
the power of attorney, healthcare, surgical living law. That is absolutely the very first thing I would do. No question about it. And we can always build off of it. This has been great. I don't know how much time we have. I think we've probably gone over it actually. But are there any other questions before we go? Remember, if you want to contact me, you're welcome to. I never answer my phone, so don't try to call me uh, in weeks before you ever hear back. But I am pretty good with text, and I'm pretty good with um, email. So feel free to email if you have questions. Again, I'd like to be a resource. Uh, I believe in the mission. Uh, it's kind of like hey, what a blessing it is to find you. I wish I had known about this organization a long time ago. If I could ever be a resource to you, let me know. Thank you.